Just checking out to see who is sitting in the same seat they sit in on Sunday morning. Some of you have been very brave and you're sitting in different seats. Congratulations to you. If you're sitting in the same seat, please just get up and move. It's okay. The, the ceiling will not collapse, but that's okay. So welcome this evening. It's good to see you. And today is a very important day um, in the... Uh, Christian church and in the life of Christ and hopefully in our lives as well. It is Holy or Monday Thursday. So I want to take a few moments and just say some thank yous at the very beginning. Now Maud is here somewhere. There's Maud. Maud, thank you because Maud believes that there are 4,000 bulletins this week. So Maud has done bulletins for every service. So Maud, this looks great. Thank you for your effort and your time. And since we'll stay in the same family, Dick, thank you as well. Stacy, thank you. I was told this past week that uh, someone heard Stacy sing, not this week, but I think it was maybe the week before in church, and that she does a lovely job on the piano and has a lovely voice. So Stacy, thank you for being here with us this evening. And Vincent is here, and Vincent brought his mom. And so Vincent, thank you for that. And Vincent has a lot of reading, so we're going to double your salary tonight, okay? And Jennifer, as always, thank you as well. And I want, would like for my committee of Holy Communion people to stand up. If you were here this past week, please just, if you're able, just stand. So, so these, you need to stand up too. These folks are the ones who reminded me how I'm supposed to do this. Now, it doesn't mean that it will happen that way. It's just what they reminded me of how I'm supposed to do this. So thank you all for your time and effort. They are the ones who put the most work into tonight. So I want to say thank you for all of your effort and your wise counsel. It's always been my practice on Holy Thursday and Good Friday to not receive an offering with a plate being passed. But if you have your 30 pieces of silver offering, or if you would like to give, there are two offering plates at the back, just outside the doors. That's up to you. Um, you know, this is really not what tonight's about. Tonight's about the passion of our Christ. Um, but if you came prepared and would like to, um, please know that we will we'll be glad to receive it in that fashion. The other part, a couple things. Um, with Holy Communion, we wrestled very hard with how to serve it. Because we realized that there are people who are still uh, you know, contracting COVID, and there are people who are jet very much concerned, and that's very appropriate. And there are others who are ready just to sort of you know, throw the barn door open and charge out. So this is what we came up with, that Carrie and I will take the tongs and we will pass you the piece of bread. So please don't reach into the basket. Let us pass it to you. And we're actually gonna sort of drop it into your hand or place it into your hand. And then after we have given everyone the, the bread, we'll come around with the cup. And the cups are the individual little small cups. Um, and then we'll hand that to you as well. Um, because we didn't feel that it was ready or time for the shared common cup for intention yet. And then I learned today from an Episcopal, Episcopal priest friend of mine that the diocese in their denomination has opened up to using the common cup. So maybe that's out there. We want to try to make some steps towards normalcy. Um, but we're going to take it slowly and be careful. And we want everyone uh, to be well in this sense. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of other things during communion. I'm going to ask that you, if you, as the ushers direct, you come down this aisle and that you exit this aisle. Now, I do believe that everybody who is here this evening, I know, but I just want to make this comment because that's what uh, is important for us as United Methodists to share before the sacrament. This evening's <clears throat> sacrament and all sacraments use of Holy Communion in the United Methodist Church are open to everyone. You don't have to be a member. 
Uh, you don't have to be a United Methodist. We practice open communion. That means we invite to Christ's table everyone. And we'll be bringing you up in groups of 12. There's a seat for Carrie and for myself, and then there's the empty seat for Jesus with the white cloth. And so just know that you'll come up this aisle, exit this aisle, so that the next group would have access to that. So let me take just a moment <clears throat> and check with my committee. Is there anything that I missed that we need to cover, or particularly with regard to the sacrament? Shirley, Bennett, anyone in my, are we okay? Are we okay? All right, so let's proceed. And let me formally welcome you to our Holy Thursday service and simply say thank you so much for coming and being here. Um, I hope this evening is as meaningful to you as the reality of this day is to myself and all of you. Welcome in Christ's name. Nick.
Good evening. Please join me in the call to worship. Let us stand of able and participate in a responsive reading. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Please stand if able, well, continue standing, and sing hymn number 298, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. It's appropriate that when we do a prayer of confession and pardon that we be seated or kneeling because we are asking for the forgiveness of our sins from our Savior. So I invite you to pray this act of confession and pardon with me at this time. My sisters and brothers, Christ shows us his love by becoming a humble servant. Let us draw near to God and confess our sin in the truth of God's Spirit. We all pray together. Most merciful God, we, your church, confess that often our spirit has not been that of Christ. Where we have failed to love one another as he loves us, where we have pledged loyalty to him with our lips and then betrayed, deserted, or denied him, forgive us, we pray. And by your Spirit, make us faithful in every time of trial. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So I invite you into a time of silent prayer, where you might confess your individual sins to Christ as we prepare later in this service to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion. Dear friends, hear this good news. Who, in, who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. But Christ suffered and died for us, was raised from the dead and ascended on high for us, and continues to intercede for us. Believe the good news. 
In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. So I was telling a couple persons as I came in, that they came in this evening, Vincent, I had to uh, make a change in the Bible that I use. I went out this past week and I was noticing that as I was reading the Bible, my nose kept getting lower and lower and lower because the print was small. So I have purchased a giant print Bible. And I think if you hold it up in the back of the church, we can see it from there. <laughs> But Vincent, thank you, because you're doing most of the work tonight. So I invite you to come. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel, that on the 10th of this, of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for the lamb, it shall join its closest obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You, shall, you may take it from the sheep or the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it into two doorposts and the lintel of the houses which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb the same night they sh shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat it of it, any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over the fire with its head and legs and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until morning. Anything that remains until morning, you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your, loin, your loins grinded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it hurry, hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see blood, I will pass over you and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Please remain seated and sing hymn 288, verses one to two, one and two, were you there?
Please now hear Psalm, Psalm chapter 116, verses 1 to 2 and 12 to 19. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord's is death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving girl. You shall have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and a call of the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Please, see, please remain seated and sing hymn 288, verses 3 and 1. Were you there? Thank you. Please now hear John chapters 13, verses 1 through 17. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from the world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, to wipe them with a towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet and put on his robe and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, 
nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. The New Commandment. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and he will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just, I have, just how I, I have loved you. And you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are disciples, if you have loved one another. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Please remain seated and sing hymn 288. Verse 5, were you there? just going to suggest that you might want to go and sit in the congregation so you can see what's going to be on the screen. I was wondering. But thank you both. And Vincent, thank you. You did a tremendous job. And Jennifer, you did okay too. <laughs> so let us pray. Lord, on this Holy Thursday evening, speak through me. Speak in spite of me. Speak to all of these dear ones who are gathered here and those who on this evening are gathered across the world in churches and in places of worship. Might we truly begin to understand and to experience deep down in our souls the passion, the love of our Christ. And may we go from this place changed because we have met you. This we pray in the name of our Christ. Amen. I'm going to ask you to observe two pieces of art this evening and are you able to see it or do we need to turn some more lights down <coughs> so I, I'm trying to get to gaze up here and just see but I can't tell for sure so Carrie thank you let's just, we can turn them back up for communion if we need to but if we make it a little bit darker it might be more visible <coughs> This first picture is a painting by Heinrich Hoffman. It hangs in Riverside Church in New York City, and it is that wonderful rendering of Jesus praying on Holy Thursday in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
I would imagine that most of you have seen some rendition of Hoffman's painting before. And it's a beautiful painting, isn't it? The only problem is it's all wrong. And here's why it's wrong. We like to think of Jesus and the disciples and the biblical stories as if persons were always well-dressed, had just had their hair done, and remained perfectly clean all the time. But we know from the reading that we just heard this evening, that's not the case. So while Hoffman's painting is beautiful and is worthy of our consideration, um, it's not accurate. One of the prized possessions I have is a J.B. Phillips translation of the New Testament that was my dad's. And, and, and Steve, the back of that Bible is worn so that there's nothing there. The pages are all falling out because both my dad and I had an affinity for the Phillips translation of the Bible. Phillips reminds us that in this portion of scripture that Jesus as he is in the garden becomes terribly, terribly stressed. He's anticipating the cross. He is aware of what is ahead of him. And like any person who is completely, fully human, he would love to find another way. But he is absolutely, totally committed to doing what God sent him into the world to do. His commitment is full and complete. And so he prays, not my will, but your will be done. And the text tells us that his sweat became as if it were drops of blood. And I know what stress is to some degree, probably other persons know greater than I. Maybe you are one of them. But when we're under that level of stress, committing to something that lies ahead that is both frightening and horrible and yet wonderful in some mysterious way, we don't nearly look this good. But this is one of the events of tonight in the life of Jesus. But in just a moment, I'd like to direct your attention to another painting, another work of art, which is much older than Hoffman's painting. In fact, in about 1510, the plague was ravaging, ravaging excuse me, northern Europe. And the monks of St. Anthony's monastery and church were tasked with caring for those whose lives were terribly, horribly affected by the plague. And this form of the plague <clears throat> arose from eating rye grain that had been also opened to and had begun to mold. And it was something called St. Anthony's fire that was a horrible, horrible death. You first began to hallucinate. And just so you know, not that I've ever done this, but it's the same type of thing that you get LSD from. So that might give you some idea. And then they began to have marks of the boils all over their body. So in 1510, Matthias <clears throat> Grunewald was tasked with, how do I show people that even in the midst of this horrible plague, even in the midst of their suffering, in the midst of their hurt, that Jesus is with them? And this is what he came up with. So Carrie and Austin, would you please... Thank you. Now, it's hard for you guys to see. And I wish we could have a, a, paint, a picture copy that is in each of your hands. But you'll see and note that the body of Jesus is darkened in both the lower and upper panels. That's because of 
Jesus is pictured as one who has the plague, one who identifies with people. And all over his body are pot marks because he is pictured in that same way as having that same skin disease. And for people who were being cared for, who had the plague, who knew that their lives were coming to an end because there was no cure, having this image of Jesus as one who is one with us. In Grunewald's thinking, brought comfort and hope. You know, we can face most any problem if we believe that Jesus understands, right? And also if Jesus identifies with us. We're reminded that Jesus is a high priest in Hebrews, one who is aware of and carries some of the pain and shares our hurt, our struggle, our problem. So tonight, when we come to this Holy Thursday event, we see not the beautiful Jesus of Hoffman's painting, which at one level is more attractive to us, but we see the Jesus who bears our pains and who endured our stripes, as Isaiah tells us in the Old Testament, so that we might receive physical and spiritual healing. So we're going to leave this image up during the sacrament of Holy Communion. And as you're waiting to receive the sacrament, waiting to come down among your group of 12, that gives you the chance to see this Jesus who identifies with us, who is affected in the same way, who loves and understands. And after all, the love of Jesus is what tonight is all about. One writer about preaching on Holy Thursday said to do this, tell the story and get out of the way. So that's my hope for tonight, is to tell you the story of two people who play a role in tonight's events and just get out of the way. The first is Judas. Judas is a, portion, a part of this story because on Holy Thursday, he will betray Christ. He is among those disciples who are there at the table. One of those chairs, as they're vacant now, would have been a chair occupied by Judas Iscariot. And he is at the place where Jesus is passing the bread and the cup. And the, Jesus has just said, one of you will betray me. And they all ask, is it I? It's more of a sense, a rhetorical question, but they're asking, is it I who will betray you? Judas knows, and at that time when Judas asks the questions and Christ responds, Judas is dipping his piece of bread into the cup. And Ju Jesus says to Judas, whatever you are going to do, do it quickly. And so in a few hours, Jesus, Judas will come back and he will kiss Jesus on the cheek as a signal that it is this one that they're looking for. And in a wonderful part of the text that we don't talk often about, the Roman soldiers and those crowd in the crowd who have come to arrest Jesus to take him away to be crucified will fall back in response to the power of God that is present. What do we know about Judas? We do know that he was the treasurer among the disciples and that he was one who had been for some time stealing money from the shared treasury. We know that at some point the text, the scripture tells us that Satan entered Judas and prompted him to betray Jesus. Why would he do that? We certainly think, had we been there, that we would never have done that, right? 
There's a lot of thinking about why Judas did this. But maybe the best thinking goes to say that Judas was a part of a political party in ancient Israel called the Zealots. And that he was there because he wanted to see the political power and independence of Israel restored. They were a group of people who carried with them all the time a knife called a Sakari. And the likelihood is that also was among that group because we know from this text that what does he do? He cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant. And that's why he would have had a sword with him that night. The zealots were always ready to respond. And there is some thought that Judas thought, if I just push him hard enough, he'll certainly bring back the political power, the earthly kingdom of Israel. But Jesus has said over and over again to Judas and to us, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my disciples would fight. As I look out in this crowd tonight, I don't think any of us have any, had any fights today, have we? But the kingdom of God is different. This past Tuesday at the afternoon Bible study, we talked about what happened to Judas. Judas takes the money back to the chief priest and those who gave it to him to betray Jesus. And he says, I no longer want it. And he throws it down that 30 pieces of silver and runs out. The money can't be used for anything, so it buys a cemetery just outside the gates of Jerusalem. I wish in his running out, in some way, Jesus, Judas would have run into Jesus. Maybe Judas would have said at that time, Lord, I'm so remorseful, I'm so sorry. What I have done is so horrible. Please forgive me. Isn't that a really cool thing? Jesus would have. How I know that is if Jesus would forgive Judas, he would forgive us. And vice versa. We don't know whether Judas ever repented, to use the church term of that, his acts. We do know that he was sorry, that he was remorseful, and in the end, Judas hangs himself. So overwhelmed by what he had done, is he? But Jesus' love is so large, it can and did include Judas. And the second character in this, just briefly, that is so important, that plays a wonderful role, that is sort of like one of my favorite disciples, if you can have a favorite disciple. I know that's kind of nerdy, but that's okay. Is Peter. I don't know about you, but I feel like Peter a lot of times. I try really hard to think before I speak, but I often speak before I think. And the things that come out of my mouth are often so obvious that they didn't really even need to be said. And Peter does that. When Jesus is washing the feet of the disciples, as you guys read this evening, he says, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? As if, you don't need to do that. I'm all right. We can go without this. It's okay. And then when he accedes to having his feet washed, it's not just his feet, it's his entire body. Peter always overdid it, didn't he? Peter also will say in this evening, I will never, ever, ever, ever desert you. Even if everybody else flees and runs, and the truth is they do, and I think one of the great pains of the cross for Christ is that it's held in isolation. But Jesus says, Peter, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. And it happens, right? I'm glad that you and I have never denied Christ, right? We've never failed to live up to 
what Jesus wants us and calls us and models for us to be. I know I have. I don't know about you guys, but in total honesty, I know I have. Peter, though, runs into Jesus in a way that Judas never had the chance to. Later on in the gospel, in, excuse me, the book of Acts in the gospels, it talks about Peter being restored and being a great missionary. And that happens when Peter has gone back to that which is familiar. That what, isn't that what happens when we are so stressed and we don't know the way ahead? We go back to what we used to do. Peter goes back to fishing and he sees Jesus on the shore and he jumps into the water and he gets to shore and Jesus says to him three times, Peter, feed my sheep. Peter, feed my lambs. Peter, feed my sheep. And most, more, most people think it's because of the three denials that Jesus is restoring Peter. That God's love con consumes and includes not only Judas who betrayed him, but also Peter who denied him. And it includes you and me this evening. The whole world. God's love is so great. Tonight is about love. After all, it's Holy Thursday. It's Monday Thursday. And we've talked before about the statement, greater love has no one than that he laid out his life or her life for his friends. And tonight we heard read so well, I give you this new commandment. Love one another, even as I have first loved you. So I go back to this painting in, conclu in conclusion. If you can use your imagination and think for a moment back to the 1500s and you were suffering from some horrible medical condition, that you knew would in the end take your life or my life. And you saw this Jesus whose body bore the same marks, the same discoloration, the same disfigurement as yours did. And it, you were cared for in the hospital there in Eisenbein. You would know. So great is the love of God that he will endure all things for us. And truthfully, that's what he did. Amen. I'm going to come down here and try to use my loud voice and share with you the liturgy for Holy Communion. Carrie, if you can come on down once you get your lights up. Great, thank you, sir. And again, uh, we're going to be inviting you to come up in groups of 12 to be seated. Karen will serve you at this end of the table. I will serve you at this end of the table. Um, you know, folks, I want you to feel safe and secure. So however you feel comfortable, if you don't feel comfortable in this way, it's okay. Just come up and sit with us and be pressed. Um, we do have a gluten free. Uh, should that be something that you need? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. From the earth you bring forth bread and create the fruits of the vine. You formed us in your image, delivered us from captivity, and made covenant to be our sovereign God. You fed us manna in the wilderness and gave gracious evidence of the promised land. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. When we had turned aside from your way, you 
used your gifts, you gave us in him your crown. Emptying himself that our joy might be full, he fed the hungry, healed the sick, ate with the scorn and forgotten, washed his disciples' feet, and gave a holy meal as a pledge of his abiding presence. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood that the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. For out your Holy Spirit and us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory. And we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, in your Holy Church, all honor and glory to the Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And let us pray together in Jesus' Christ. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we give us not temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thy kingdom, power, and glory. Dear friends, the table of Christ is open, and Carrie and I invite you to come at the direction of our So he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. 
This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance. And after the supper was over, he took the cup, and he said, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Drink from this, all of you, knowing that Christ died for you. Dear friends, know the peace and love of Christ this evening and every day of Jesus.
last week or yesterday, we met together and talked about how to do this. So I have a great urge to ask the group that I do it okay. Um, but I, I'm getting thumbs up, so I think we're all right. But in all seriousness, folks, um, this is a very serious and important thing. We're going to ask you to depart in silence. Um, just out of respect to what Christ will go through here for us. Um, tomorrow from 12 until 3, the sanctuary will be open. Um, I sadly will not be here. Um, I have a, a funeral tomorrow for a friend of Dick's and mine uh, in Bridgeville. One of the most godly men I ever knew, Sonny Hardison, passed away. So I'm sharing in that service. I will be back for tomorrow evening. But Terry has everything under control for tomorrow, and I trust him and he will be here to like come and pray. Um, we'll leave this just up as it is, okay? And it's just a time for uh, you to come here in the afternoon to uh, stay and pray as long as you'd like during the hours of 12 until 3, because that's the day when we believe that Christ was on the cross for us. It was very, perhaps, the most sacred moments of the entire year. Our closing hymn is, Alas and did my Savior believe in 294. Thank you for being here. Let us stand and say to pray together. Gracious God, your anointed one on the night before he suffered, instituted the sacrament of his body and blood. Mercifully grant that it may, we may receive it thankfully and in remembrance of Jesus Christ our Lord, who in these holy mysteries gives us a pledge of eternal life. Amen. Dear friends, thank you for being here and please depart in silence.